in transitional justice context because that's kind of a separate special thing rather than talking about forensics in national contexts. Now, I started my career, so to say, in, in human rights right about the same time as Patrick Ball did and pretty much in the same country that Patrick Ball did. Um, we got to know of each other a little later, but <clears throat> I started working in Guatemala. My background actually um, from college is forensic, uh, is archaeology and anthropology. From being in Guatemala in the midst of a civil war, which at that time was happening, I ended up um, becoming a forensic anthropologist, uh, digging up mass graves in Guatemala, and then went on. Um, once I realized that I needed a PhD and uh, adv you know, advancement on an academic level, I ended up in the United States and uh, got my master's in criminology and criminal justice, but um, worked with her for the Florida Department of Law Enforcement within their justice system and their forensic laboratory. I went through the whole PhD program, but I'm one of those people that, because of all the work, I never got around to writing my PhD thesis, which is, a, that's my excuse at least. Um, and later on, I took on the uh, directorship of um, the International Forensics Program at Physicians for Human Rights, who might basically have been working with since the early 90s in, uh, in Guatemala. <clears throat> I've been members, uh, a member of forensic teams to, my first one was actually in Iraq. And that one was also one of those missions that kind of showed me and taught me very much about the pragmatism uh, uh, of what human rights work is about because while we were exhuming a mass grave that um, Saddam Hussein and his troops had, been, had perpetrated at the same time the Turks were bombing Kurdish villages within our view of which we of course did little to do any kind of reporting on. Uh, so that was my first kind of learning curve of, you know, this work can be extremely cynical and that taught me at the same time that that's why we have to be, or in my case, I have to be a scientist because I felt that at least with science, science is like mathematics. It's a language that's universally understood and that has universal rules to it. So. One of the things that I wanted to address also before I continue on is that after working at the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and their forensic laboratory and testifying in US courts within a justice system that to me, as someone who just came out of Guatemala from 10 years of living in Guatemala and living under the fear of getting killed or the fear of my family <clears throat> being persecuted, uh, to me was like paradise. I get to work in a real justice system. But one of the things that it really, really acutely taught me is that justice is never about the truth, okay? And that is something that's very important, especially for people who work with victims. It's very important to, to, to be able to express that justice is about determining whether somebody is guilty of a crime, of a specific crime that's defined by the law. And all that the court has to do is to prove that that crime was committed and the court then is responsible for determining the punishment. And oftentimes, or most of the times, that means the court doesn't have to look at all the different circumstances under which a crime occurred. And the second thing about this is that for money victims, the punishment that the perpetrators get is not just. So if you have courts that are basically governed by the standards of what European thinks punishment is, that might not be enough for what happened to the victims. A good example is, for instance, the ca case of Charles Taylor. Charles, Charles Taylor, after many millions of dollars, many, many, many years of uh, investigations and whatnot, I think he got like 40 or 50 years in prison, whereas his son, who was convicted in the United States in a court of law there, after three weeks was convicted to 99 years in prison. No parole, he's never getting out. So you can see there's different standards of how that influences uh, punishment and how that will be perceived by victims. And I think that's something that 
is important to say, and especially is important to say to those victims who come forward with the hopes that there will be some sort of justice. Um, in that sense, it's important to say that truth-seeking is a process, okay, of which justice is a small part of. And when I say process, it's something that happens over decades and sometimes over centuries. Because if you think about like Germany, in Germany, there are still things today that are coming out, not only in court, but are historically coming out that previously nobody ever talked about. So, the big thing for me is, because of what I do, is I actually go to crime scenes, I actually examine and document physical evidence, and where I have the jurisdiction, I actually collect physical evidence to be examined by experts, reported on by experts, and introduced into court. So a big question is, what does crime scene mean? Okay, and by a crime scene, a crime scene has a temporal dimension, meaning it happened between then and then, okay? It has a spatial or geographic dimension, meaning that it happened at a specific location, okay? And it has a legal context or nature of the crime, right? meaning that supposedly it's where a homicide happened, okay, or where a massacre happened. Now, in countries where you have automatic jurisdiction because you're the guy who's in charge of crime scenes or you're the police officer that has jurisdiction, <clears throat> oftentimes you just have to go to a location to even first determine whether a crime has happened or not. Then, another very important thing is, and this is, this again, under ideal circumstances, you have a set of people or you have an individual who's designated to identify the evidence, meaning this cartridge casing is evidence, this rock beside it is not evidence, okay? So you have somebody who identifies the evidence. So then the question, of course, is what actually constitutes evidence, okay? And the, the word evidence is very loosely used, primarily in, in the press. So if you read a journalist's article, they'll, they'll say, well, we collected evidence on X, Y, and Z, and this is why this means that. But in a court of law, <clears throat> evidence is decided by the court, meaning that you can collect anything you want, but it's gonna be the court that's going to decide whether this particular piece of information or this particular piece of physical evidence is actually evidence, okay? They're going to be the ones who are gonna decide, yes, this was collected correctly, this was doc documented correctly, this is credible, and therefore it can be entered into a court of law, okay? Then <clears throat> we have chain of custody. Chain of custody, again, is one of those things where most people think chain of custody is just a whole bundle of receipts, meaning that you know somebody picks something up and then hands it over to the next one and they kind of write the receipt that they received, this, that, and the other, and it just goes down the line that way. <clears throat> Truth again is that a chain of custody, when we're talking about forensics, and forensics meaning applying science within to answer a legal question or within a legal framework, okay, the chain of custody also means that the people inside the chain of custody are people that fall within the jurisdiction, meaning that the people that fall... So it starts off with the crime scene technician who collects the evidence, okay? He's designated. Then it goes on to the laboratory. Within the laboratory, it's handed to the different analysts and out comes a report. So there is a legal custodian Okay, and it's verifiable and credible, meaning that it's verifiable in the sense, does this evidence technician actually exist? Can I bring somebody into court to say, I picked, yes, I picked this up at such and such a crime scene, okay? <clears throat> and is the person who did this credible? Meaning, do, do, did they, do they have the education and the training necessary to be able to handle this? So, I'm going to start off with a series of examples, and I'm gonna start off with Guatemala, where I started a group of forensic anthropologists that started documenting mass graves that had happened in Guatemala. 
<clears throat> then I'm going to go and talk a little about the work that we did in ICTR, uh, which is the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. And then in Afghanistan, which I call the forgotten war, because in Afghanistan there is really no legal space whatsoever to uh, even address past human rights violations. Uh, and then into Libya, where Libya really exists, there is no existing jurisdiction because one of the problems in Libya is, is you don't even have a recognized government. There's a UN recognized government, but there's no real de facto recognized government. So it's pretty much a state and complete comes to that. And then I'm going to talk a little about locating graves, what the method and technology behind that is, and I'll follow it up with an example of what satellite imagery can do as far as analysis uh, of some of these contexts are. So Guatemala, um, the, t the, air, the time that we were looking at was basically designated as the time of violence in Guatemala, which was an increase in counterinsurgency campaigns, something that was supported by the U.S. government. A lot of the military in Guatemala was trained, and a lot of the training happened on the basis of the experience that the U.S. had had in Vietnam, which um, the idea was that <clears throat> insurgencies basically draw their power through being in rural inaccessible areas where they get fed and where they can store their weapons and where they can recruit um, their people or their soldiers so to say uh, for the insurgency and therefore counterinsurgency meant quite literally in order to get to the fish you needed to drain the, uh, drain the lake so the idea behind that was you had to depopulate the rural areas either through migrating people into areas that you could control <clears throat> And you did this through uh, force uh, and most of the time through mm, campaigns of terror, which uh, meant that um, large parts of Guatemala or in lots of villages, people were massacred and buried in mass graves. Um, so <clears throat> the result was, and the numbers here are incorrect, uh, the result was, and this is actually something which is really interesting because Patrick Ball was the one who came up with the numbers for Guatemala. The, nu the, the number that Patrick Ball floated initially was a total of 200,000 uh, dead in Guatemala, 50,000 of which were disappeared, meaning 150,000 killed and buried, and 50,000 that had been kidnapped, abducted, and most likely were dead, but you didn't really know they were disappeared. Okay, And this was, again, built on a statistical model. And this is really interesting because now uh, Patrick and I uh, have now several times talked several uh, times about his method now. And what we know then is that those numbers very obviously uh, need to be adjusted, meaning that they're higher than... Uh, than what was suspected initially. And it's really interesting because it also shows you the kind of political relevance here because the number 200,000, and he just told me this, um, became 250,000 because they took the number of 200,000 dead and then added the 50,000 that are actually part of the 200,000 group on top of that. So the number that for many years was used by the international community and you know politicians on the left uh, in Guatemala was a number of 250,000. Okay, so it kind of shows you again what the political relevance is. And another example of <clears throat> why, even though I work for the justice system and I collect evidence so that it can be collected in court, and I teach NGOs how to collect evidence or doc to do documentation in such a way that it can be entered into court, one of the things that I am acutely aware of is that justice is also acutely political. For instance, the case that um, that Patrick showed about the lady, that's no random lady. That's Ninette Montenegro de Garcia. She is like the top most human rights activist in Guatemala and a very prominent politician now. And the convictions they got, they got during the time there was a left-wing government in Guatemala. Okay, so these are not coincidences and for the great majority of people, and my wife is Guatemalan, for instance, her cousin who disappeared, their family never went in order to report that to any lists or are ever 
going to try to get any kind of justice for it. So you, so you can see that uh, justice really has a differential meaning once you put things into context. Um, <clears throat> so the civilian population basically suffered massacres, tortures, and kidnappings. Um, 36 years of oppressive justice, social cleansing, which was uh, carried out by military and police, secret detentions and disappearances, and especially extrajudicial executions. Now, one of the models that, that states use is that these are terror campaigns where the state deliberately does this in such a way so that everybody knows. It's not that it's a secret where the mass graves are. So, Two important considerations are family and victim witness support and trust. Obviously, without that, you can't work. Uh, <clears throat> jurisdiction, which was important when we started our work in Guatemala. We couldn't just go out and start digging up mass graves. We had to find judges who were going to allow us to conduct a uh, mass grave exhumation. And the way that happened was that we convinced a medical examiner in Guatemala, in one of the rural areas of Guatemala, who was very upset with the fact that the central government wasn't giving her the correct amount of support, said, yes, I will accept you in as uh, forensic experts and you're gonna work under me. And the judge allowed the exhumation, not in order to start a criminal investigation, which would have been, of course, the ideal case scenario, but in order to relocate the remains, basically to repatriate the remains. So what was used was a loophole in Guatemalan law for the transport of human remains from one place to a cemetery. So that's how we started and established our jurisdiction in Guatemala. And this was in 1992. So during that time, uh, the civil war was still gone, going on. The people who had committed a vast majority of the massacres in Guatemala were uh, president of Congress, they were very powerful people, they were generals in the military, so it was very clear that you know, we were only going to be able to do this if they would let us live. Okay. <clears throat> so we made sure that we had jurisdiction in order to be able to, uh, to carry out this work. <clears throat> so with the support from the American Academy for the Advancement of Sciences, their human rights uh, department, and Physicians for Human Rights, we founded the Guatemalan Forensic Anthropology Team, and at the time we were all a bunch of archaeology and anthropology students from different universities uh, in Guatemala. So the massacre that we're looking at is probably the biggest one, or one of the biggest ones, uh, single biggest mass graves that was exhumed, I would say, in, uh, at the time, probably even in the world. Uh, it was a minimum number of 161 people, exclusively women and children. Um, and um, <clears throat> this was in an area that, um, under the auspices of the World Bank, uh, had been flooded. So this coincides, the massacre coincides with the flooding of the valley in order to build a dam. So there were many different levels of interest that were existing here. Um, this was the village when we got to it. At the time, only about five families had returned uh, from the families that um, had been ex uh, affected by this massacre. And later on, more and more families returned to the area to claim back their lands. <clears throat> but at, that, at this time, the area was still so remote that basically, if you were a uh, native Mayan and as fit as they, it, you know, would have taken you, I think, a six-hour hike. That means for, even when I was younger, I was pretty heavy set and a smoker. It would have taken me probably twice the amount to walk there. Uh, or a several-hour ride by car to the dam and then a several-hour ride on by boat to, to this area. So very, very remote. The mass grave, again, was not that people don't know where mass graves are, and I think this is also very important to note for the documentation efforts that you're trying to undertake here in, in South Korea with respect to the mass graves in, in North Korea, is that mass graves are very rarely secret, okay? And the reason behind this is that, and I kind of call it the mass backyard mass grave syndrome, is that if you have a mass grave of your family in your back grave and you know it, but you're not allowed to put any flowers on it or a cross or 
whatever it is that your religion and culture requires you in order to honor the dead, that means you live with that fear all the time. It's a, rem it's a reminder of who's in charge. If you can't acknowledge the crimes that have been committed against you and you're reminded of that every day, that's a psychological burden you carry, carry with yourself and that reminds you again of who's in power. So mass graves very rarely are places that are secret meaning that populations often know where they are, they're just not allowed to talk about it, or they're in fear to talk about it. And in this case, they actually had a cross on it when we got to it. <clears throat> so this is how it started, and you can see uh, we have several of our, uh, let's see, this thing have a, well, you can see in the foreground the two guys with the blue shirts, that was Guatemalan police officers who were about as corrupt as they can come. But, <laughs> you know, we actually had to force them to come there in order to guard the crime scene. We wanted to make sure that from a legal perspective, there was nothing that anybody could say 20 years down the road when this goes to court to say that we tampered with the evidence or something of the sort happened, okay? So that's why we had those guys there. Uh, so tents were set up and all the other stuff. I don't really want to go through it too much, but this was basically a review to which uh, the... the um, civil patrols, because that was another mechanism that the United States installed uh, both in Vietnam and in Guatemala, now in Afghanistan, uh, where they armed civilians in order to fight the counterinsurgency in the rural areas. And these guys came around and they basically, uh, in a series of massacres, this being the biggest one, um, killed, the, killed these villagers. <clears throat> they took the women, the men had fled. They knew the men, that these guys were coming and thinking they were coming for them. So the men and the older boys all fled. Didn't expect them to haul all the women and the children up the mountain and they proceeded to rape the women and, uh, and, <clears throat> and kill the children. Some of which they basically just flung against the tree in order to bash them in the tree and threw them into the, into the ravine and then covered up the ravine. Uh, it wasn't until later that the survivors came and they covered it up in order to avoid the rain from carrying it all off. So this was a major archaeological uh, exhumation. <clears throat> so we had to determine ages. Uh, this is a, a, actually a female, one of the females, uh, and she was pregnant at the time. And you can see um, the little black and white thing down there. Each one of those squares is a centimeter, so you can imagine how small those remains of that fetus are. Um, and we found several pregnant women. And what was very interesting was that when we had gone out to conduct the anti-mortem interviews with the, with the witnesses to the massacre to find out who all had died, uh, we ended up having more children in our sample than we did in the anti-mortem interviews. And a lot of that, we assumed, had to do with the fact that infant mortality is so high in Guatemala that a lot of them, they don't even count until they're about two to three years old. People don't really register them as, you know, until they get a certain age uh, where they actually survive, uh, meaning surviving childhood disease and those kind of things. <clears throat> So here we have another very young child. This is an older uh, child right there, but still pre, um, um, so below 12 years of age. And then of course there was a lot of evidence that we really didn't know how to deal with, like documentary evidence. You know, all of a sudden you have to think about, you know, how, how do you treat this stuff so, you know, that it, you know, that it doesn't degrade any further, and how do you document that? <clears throat> and this is a cartridge casing. And these cartridge casings were important also because it also, not, it, it documents several different things. One is how many weapons were used, right? Because of the firing pin indentions into the, uh, into the cartridges, they're different from firearm to firearm. So we can tell you how many firearms you had, uh, which firearms sh shot which of those cartridges. And then there is evidence uh, like this, which is, and I'll talk about some of this uh, tomorrow during the workshop a little more detail. But, you know, here, for instance, I don't know, is this, oh, there we go. H here you can see this is part of the skull right here, but the important fact, right, is, is what, what you're seeing right here and this thing right here. And this is a noose. <clears throat> 
And what this documents right here, and this is why it's important to document this in place, because once you remove it, you don't see it any, you know, you basically destroyed the context, is that this woman, she was choked to death with, a gir with what's called a garrote, a garret. Okay, basically what it is, is that this is the area that her neck was squeezed down to, and in this area, you had, a, you, you had this, this piece of wood and it was used in order to ch slowly choke her to death and then she was kicked into the grave. <clears throat> Another example is, and this is uh, from an exhumation in Honduras, is hands to hi tied behind their backs. Okay, and these are all things that when you document them, you have to document them right there in place because as soon as you do the, ex as soon as you exhume the remains, that context is gone, okay? And it kind of highlights why it's important that you know who did the exhumation, who took the photographs, when were they taken, and that you can prove that this was done in a standard fashion, okay? That you can cross-reference, not, not that you don't only have the photographs, but you also have documentation in, let's say, a gravesite sketch, and that you have documentation in the notes from the investigator, so that you have several levels of documentation that prove that this indeed is the case. And this is not some random photograph taken by a no-name NGO phot photographer, okay? You want to know, Stefan took this picture. So that at any time when it goes to court, you can say, the judge can say, I want Stefan here to confirm that that's actually the photograph he took, okay? All right, now another very important thing is that, <clears throat> and this is unlike working in jurisdictions like in the United States where when you're with the police, you put a crime scene tape around your crime scene and everybody gets to stay outside. Because inherently in justice systems, and I assume that North Korea is the same way or similar, people trust, generally, <laughs> trust their police and their judicial system. Okay, but in Guatemala and in places where that's not the case, okay, where people deeply, deeply distrust the judicial system, it's important that you leave a space for the victims in order to be able to observe what happens. And what was interesting is that at that particular massacre, and this became standard uh, later on, the Catholic Church actually in Guatemala uh, later on declared Guatemalan Mayan priests as pretty much being equivalent to a Catholic priest. So what we had here was we had a mass which was both Catholic priest and a Mayan priest at the same time. And after that, at most of the grave sites that we went, we actually had a Mayan priest who'd come and give us their blessings before we would go ahead and do the exhumation. <clears throat> Another thing that we did, because at the time it, DNA was just not a possibility, this is the early 90s, mind you, uh, and I know that when I started working at the Florida Department of Law Enforcement in 1996, you still needed like a tablespoon full of blood in order to get DNA. Now, you could just swab this and you could m get my DNA off of it and Patrick's and anybody else who's touched it, right? So we basically need very, very little sample. But in those days, you needed a lot. So what we'd also do is we'd lay out all the clothing that we would find in the hopes that we would have witnesses be able to identify pieces, articles of clothing as belonging to whomever that might belong. In the end, that turned out to be a very unscientific process. It never worked correctly. But one thing that was important was that psychologically, it was important to the families. Okay, because uh, to them, it showed that we were doing something, you know, that there was work that was being done. It was part of a process and they were part of the process. Um, so, yeah, at the time, we only did one tentative identification, something that nowadays you would never do. Uh, you either have an identification or you don't. <laughs> you don't have a tentative identification. But in those days, identification just simply weren't, weren't possible. <clears throat> But what resulted was that when we returned the remains, the families got together and they, in a big demonstration, carried the caskets past the military base out of, you know, that was partially responsible for these massacres to uh, their final resting place, which was this monument. And this is actually the second monument because the first monument they had was a little smaller. 
and somebody obviously from the military base, which was just across from the cemetery, came around and smashed it all up. So the internationals got together, <laughs> spent, I don't know, this cost like $7,000, and they put so much cement and concrete in it, it was impossible, and it was never destroyed again. But long story short, what's important is that this gave the families a space to put the list of family members that had been killed during this massacre, right, and their version of events. I'm not saying that we as scientists validated their version of events, okay, but you know, to them it was important that this type of memorialization happened and to us it was equally important because we realized that justice wasn't going to happen tomorrow. Now I must say that several of the people involved in this massacre have consequently been uh, convicted in court, but you know, they're mainly lower tier people, okay, so it never rose to the actual colonels and military personnel uh, for that. <clears throat> So, what the resources uh, we're talking about is we had skeletal remains, so no flesh remains. That makes a big difference. Uh, relatively small staff. When we started the team, we were, I think, six or seven people when that exhumation happened. A uh, few resources uh, and a lot of reliance on local support. We, for instance, when we'd go out to villages, we would rely on the villagers and the human rights groups to serve us lunch. You know, so what, you know, we oftentimes ended up in a village and, you know, they would kill their chicken and make a chicken soup and, you know, we'd live off of them and they'd be the ones who'd help us, you know, dig the trenches and do the heavy lifting and work. I mean, in the end, all of us were city boys and girls and they were all, you know, all farmers who could move dirt much quicker and efficient and more efficient than we did. <clears throat> victim family involvement, obviously. And the jurisdiction was evolutionary. I call it evolutionary because, like I said, we started off with the jurisdiction through the medical examiner and the judge for the transfer of uh, human remains, and it eventually evolved to the point where the, the forensic team now, which is the foundation for, anthropo for forensic anthropology in Guatemala, FAFG, uh, they are uh, recognized expert witnesses in court. Wow, where are we with time? I got 10 minutes left? Okay. So, all right. So, um, I must say that we were the first ones to produce a Truth Commission kind of report because it was very frustrating in Guatemala that that never happened. So we actually put some staff together and we ended up writing a book about the massacres in one specific uh, county in Guatemala. Uh, we also went on to write what we called a popular version, which was like a comic book version for all those people who couldn't read on an academic level. Uh, so this is kind of what it looks like. Um, and then later on we had the uh, different um, truth commissions that um, Patrick uh, mentioned. Now, the international approach was totally different in the sense that there was a lot of money, okay? And I know that for the people who started it and who came out of the United States, it wasn't a lot of money. We only got, only got a million dollars, which was <laughs> quite, a, quite a bit of money as far as I was concerned. Um, and the approach both for the ICTR and the ICTY was no identifications, meaning they were exclusively interested in just purely the evidence and looking at graves from a perspective of is this widespread or systematic, okay, is this genocide or not, um, <clears throat> and which then was later amended when they all of a sudden realized, okay, there's a whole bunch of victims and they're really, really unhappy. In the former Yugoslavia, the ICMP formed which addressed the identifications uh, of, of the remains. But what you found in Rwanda was that, and Bill Haglund called it, the well-meaning and the desperate, was the collection of, of, of bones into big piles, which scientifically means that you know, you've really lost the majority of your data and information right there because it's been disassociated, and the cost of trying to reassociate these into individuals is impossible, okay? Um, so the mass grave that we did in Kibuya was a mass grave that resulted in, I think, like over a minimum number of like 460 to 470 people in it. Uh, and we had a backhoe. That's where I learned how to operate one of these machines, actually. Um, we had autopsy tables. And actually, 
if I'm not incorrect, this is Eric Stover right there, I believe. Um, we had autopsy tables, we had forensic pathologists who came to conduct the autopsies, we had a huge amount of staff in comparison to, let's say, what we had in, available in Guatemala. And this is me before I went all gray, uh, working on one of the skeletal remains that we had collected on the hillside, because it wasn't only the grave, it was also the hillside. Um, this is Bill Hagland, actually, and Bob Kirshner, who at the time, Bob Kirshner was the director of the Physicians for Human Rights, and Madeleine Albright. So you can see that, you know, U US Secretary of State, you know, came around in order to inspect it. There was a high, you know, there was a high expectancy. There was, politically, it was very interesting, and there was a lot of funds in order to push these things forward. Um, now, Afghanistan, um, one thing that's interesting about Afghanistan is too bad that Patrick isn't here right now, but one of the problems that I encountered in Afghanistan is that there was a group, a human rights, international human rights group that did a lot of data collection in Bosnia and in Kosovo, and they came in and said, listen, you know, it doesn't matter that people lie because it, at, you know, it evens it, statistically it evens itself out. But what ha in Afghanistan, what happens is, is that Afghanistan is a culture rooted in oral tradition, meaning that history has a political function like it does everywhere, but in Afghanistan, history is something that also guarantees your survival on a village to village level, okay? So when you bear witness in Afghanistan, that's a social responsibility. And you bear witness according to what your elders say. So what'll happen in Afghanistan is you'll have a witness and you will be talking to them, and especially if you're coming out of a Western humanist kind of culture, it will take you about 20 minutes to figure out that this person is not actually an eyewitness. They're recounting a story just like out of oral tradition. And you will hear that story over and over and over again until you realize, you know, this is the agreed upon story of this group of victims or this surviving group. Because a village will trade hands in power from the Taliban over to the government over to some other group and each one will negotiate what their story is. And the elders will tell everybody else what that story is and it's your responsibility to tell the story as is. Therefore, you know, mapping in Afghanistan had the additional difficulty that it was very difficult to actually get at eyewitnesses because if somebody tells an eyewitness story in Afghanistan, that's almost a taboo because they're supposed to be representing their community, not themselves, okay? <clears throat> and that's what makes it extremely difficult in circumstances like that to collect victim uh, testimonies because it's really hard to get actual individual victims to testify. So here's an example of a mass grave that, oops, that was discovered and unfortunately we didn't get to it in time but what, what happened was that you know people were identified on the basis of items that they found and they had been taken out of context from the skeletal remains because the skeletal remains looked like this. They were basically shoveled together. They weren't treated with any kind of dignity, even though you can see in the pictures here that with the tent around, these tents around it, you know, the religious community, mullahs there, definitely try to give it, you know, the, the kind of treatment and respect it needed. But, you know, it was entirely dominated because of the lack of understanding on how you can do, you know, do ex exhumations on how to do this, <coughs> that, uh, they ended up doing this kind of exhumation and then reburial of the site with a monument, again, count, recounting a history that everybody had agreed upon, okay? Um, so in Libya, and I'm not gonna go through this here because I only got five minutes left, but in Libya, I actually looked at a uh, warehouse uh, where one of Libya, uh, one of the sons, Gaddafi's sons, he had, he had his own military brigade and uh, they m massacred a bunch of people inside a warehouse with the hopes that uh, they were gonna be able to blame NATO for it. Um, this is the actual compound. But one of the things I was telling you about is the sketches. This, for instance, is one of the sketches about it where I really you know, took measurements, and this is corroborated in the photographs, okay? And here you can see the, f see the photographs, come on. Here's the warehouse. 
and there were you know stories like you know that they shot through the through the gates of the warehouse and you can see you know the bullet holes in here and again the cartridge cases and this is very interesting because I took photographs of these cartridge cases uh, the way they looked what type they were with the head stamps in them and it turns out that it's a specific type of machine gun that this type of ammunition which is an old type of ammunition coming out of World War II actually uh, a machine gun which was described by the witnesses. They didn't know what kind of machine gun it was, but the way they described it, it was made it very clear what type of machine gun it was. And this cartridge casing actually can pretty much only be shot out of that type of weapon, which again is evidence that your witness is telling the truth, which is what you want to get at. So another one is right here. I, you know, one of the stories was that um, one of the officers who had a Glock nine millimeter pistol came up and, and started shooting through the through the door. I found that cartridge casing right there. That the indentation that here, for instance, is typical of a Glock. Now there are several others that have like rectangular hammers, firing pins on them. Uh, but again, this is something that corroborates a witness statement. And then, of course, there's things such as, you know, writing their names on the walls, the perpetrators, uh, because they think they're going to get away with it. Um, another thing was, you know, uh, also finding evidence of what you don't know. You don't know what it is. Okay. I remember finding a whole bunch of weather balloons and, you know, some sort of electronic gear. And I took photographs of it, as you can see right here, without really knowing what, what it meant. It wasn't until later that, you know, one of the witness testimonies said they were trying to get, you know, these weather balloons up into the air because they would broadcast signals uh, in order to get NATO to bomb the warehouse so they could blame NATO for, uh, for the deaths of these people. And I actually, you know, looked up what this was, so I made sure that I had, you know, the manufacturer, serial numbers and stuff like that. Turns out it's a Finnish art, uh, company that sells weather systems in order to improve the accuracy of your artillery. Okay, they had apparently sold Gaddafi some high-tech gear in order to get, uh, you know, to improve their artillery shooting with it. Uh, oops. So locating graves. Um, effectively locating graves, I mean, this is the first example of a s satellite or actually an aerial photograph. Uh, photographs was in Bosnia of one of the uh, mass graves where uh, aerial photography, this was released by the State Department at the time, you know, kind of provided evidence of where the location of the grave was. But effectively, the only way to really make, find out whether you have a mass grave is by digging lots of trenches, right? You have to look, you know, confirm what's under the ground, and the way to do that is really by, by digging trenches. Everything else will give you an indication of what might be there, but you're not going to have confirmation until you dig a trench. And here we were looking for a mass grave that the witnesses had said that was there. And I needed to make sure that the witnesses at the end of the day were happy that they felt I really did my job because at this point it became, I have to prove that it isn't there. Okay, I knew at some point that it, was, that it most likely wasn't there, but I had to make sure that enough trenches were dug in order to make sure that the families agreed with it. Eventually we did find it a uh, little further away from where we had initially dug the trenches, but this basically cost us, I don't know, four or five days. So satellite photography, um, since I've got to pretty much wrap up right now, is this is a mass grave that I documented in Afghanistan in 2002, right after the invasion, the US invasion. Um, and you know, I, I did sketches, took GPS measurements, um, and documented it through photography. There was an exhumation that was done several months later by Dr. Bill Hagland and one of our forensic, uh, forensic pathologists uh, of several bodies, which you can see here, which just partially opened up a grave, nothing else. Okay, and that was also logged. Now, in 2008, I ended up going back to the place, right? And it turns out what we have in the desert out there is two large holes, one principally in the area where we had our mass grave, right? So the question, of course, became what happened and uh, what happened to our evidence, right? So I had to, A, do sketches again and measurements along with GPS points to find out, you know, to be able to look at what do we have now versus what did we have then and compare that back to the sketches that I did back then. So here you can see this is, I use Google Earth. 
This is what we found in what I found in 2008 and documented. Okay, and this is my sketch from 2002. All right, and this is the exhumation from 2002. Okay, effectively, and like I said again, at this time, at this point in time, that grave we weren't, you know, we weren't. It wasn't completely ex ex uh, excavated, so we didn't know what the size of it was. But, but effectively, we know that you know this area must have contained quite a bit, and it was entirely removed uh, at the time. Then we checked on satellite, and this is something that's important for you also because uh, we actually uh, worked with the AAAS on this. Um, but to do a historical mapping also. You want to go back in time. Um, so you can see this is August 5th, 2006, okay, and one of the pits and uh, excavation, possible excavation vehicles is visible right there. Uh, you, you can see it now. This is, the, this is the pit that is of interest to us, October 24th. Come on. And, you know, we actually, you know, did analysis on the excavator and the truck type and those kind of things. But what it basically gave us is actually a precise date and time of when these excavations of these areas uh, occurred. <clears throat> and here we can see it. So by October 24, 2007, this had happened. And less than a year later when I showed up, uh, you know, this became a thing, and we definitely put out a press release at the time because what was interesting was that, you know, the representative for summary executions, uh, Phil, I can't, I can't recall the name right now, for the UN, he had actually visited the site but hadn't kind of put two and two together of what it meant. So that's why, you know, documentation, especially careful documentation, with sketching and GPS coordinates and, and documentation of actual sites is so important because it can correlate and you know put these things into context. Otherwise, you would never know. See, if I wouldn't have been able to do that, we would have never known that actually these sites have been excavated and the evidence has gotten rid of. Okay. So, thank you very much. <laughs>